it kind of just built up and built up until fast forward a decade. And you've got his team writing essays for people about how, how excited they are to go play tennis when they don't even own a tennis racket and checking off that they are a different race than they actually are because they think that'll give an advantage. Corporate fraud works best in the shadows, behind corporate walls. How does the government bring these wrongdoers to justice? Whistleblowers. These are the stories of those who risk their careers to shine a light on allegations of fraud. Today on Fraud in America. On this show, we dissect fraud schemes that involve money, power, and deceit. The college admission scandal that rocked the country a few months ago involved all of these things. Today's guests are two Wall Street Journal reporters that we relied on to understand this intriguing, complex fraud scheme. Jennifer Levitz is a national reporter with the Wall Street Journal, and Melissa Korn is a longtime higher education reporter with the Wall Street Journal. As soon as the story broke on March 12th, 2019, they were there to help us understand some of the backstories of all of the players in this matter, including the mastermind Rick Singer, to the college coaches who accepted kickbacks, to the parents who wrote checks to bribe their children through the side doors into America's most selective colleges. Their stories graced the front pages of the Wall Street Journal for months, and then found their way into the best-selling book, Unacceptable, Privilege, Deceit, and the Making of the College Admission Scandal. We discuss this book, their findings, and the tales of deceit on today's episode of Fraud in America. Well, welcome to today's show. Uh, as I said in the intro uh, that you guys just heard, we have two excellent guests uh, to talk about a book that came out a while ago, but is still very relevant and certainly on people's minds. Unacceptable, Privileged, Deceit, and the Making of the College Admission Scandal. And just on the front cover here, on the it reads, An Explosive True Crime Story of Fraud, Corruption, Greed, Celebrity, and Justice in the Cheating Scandal that Shattered the Myth of Meritocracy. Melissa, Jennifer, welcome to today's show. Thank you. So when this story broke in March of 2019, I was actually on a sabbatical for my law firm. Uh, We were helping the government prosecute fraud cases. And I took a break from my law firm to research college admissions to help low-income and middle-income families through the process. I wrote a book called Breaking into College. I was very, very interested. And then the story broke and it brought my two worlds together. So I have really been looking forward to today's conversation on so many levels. So let's start with that Tuesday, March 12th, 2019, pre-pandemic. Up in Boston, we started getting reports uh, down here, too, that there was something involving our world, fraud. Uh, The U.S. Attorney's Office was sending us press releases. Uh, The FBI sent out a press release. And if I remember right, Jennifer, you were actually at the press conference at the courthouse in Boston. Can you talk about that experience and what happened that day? Yeah, sure. So I work in the, the Boston Bureau for the Wall Street Journal. And so like you, we started getting these press releases, something big was happening. So I trot down to the courthouse um, in Boston. You can tell us right away something big's happening because the attorney general of Massachusetts is there as well as the head of the FBI in Boston yeah. and the head of the IRS office, the special agents and several prosecutors and they're all in their finest suits and the press takes a seat. And there's this big poster board with this man I've never seen in the middle. And he's got like a track suit on and they've got sort of diagrams out to all kinds of things. And then they just start to unfold, unspool the, the story about how just this nondescript, you know, college counselor out in California has been at the center of the largest education fraud investigation ever launched by the federal government. And um, this involves sort of a a catalog of wealth, CEOs and movie stars and financiers and some of the most elite universities in the country. Um, And so it was just 
a explosion of all these different um, avenues that that added up to um, an incredible investigation and an incredible story. Right. There's something kind of delicious about all of these elements, right? The super prestigious universities, the super wealthy people, the the SAT and college sports and, you know, a federal investigation and this guy in a tracksuit. Um, but it was also, there's something also kind of grotesque about it, which, you know, people obviously were fascinated by. Why was this a story for the Wall Street Journal? Names like Felicity Huffman and uh, Aunt Becky, right? Laurie Laughlin. I read the Wall Street Journal cover to cover every day. I usually don't see names like Felicity Huffman. Because it wasn't just those types of celebrities, right? Yeah. I mean, most of the people who were charged were business people, were executives, real estate investors, private equity folks. And those are the people that you do expect to read about in the journal. Um, and it was kind of funny because in at least one of their cases, one of the um, conversations that was recorded, you read the transcript and it's a, a lawyer saying, essentially, I just don't want to do anything that'll end up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was his universe, too. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I mean, People Magazine was interested in the story because it had those celebrities, but it was also, you know, kind of titans of industry uh, in the more in finance and other industries that, frankly, our readers would read about regularly. And then all of a sudden, they're now tied up in this other very different story that has nothing to do with their professional expertise. And if anything, really reveals a certain level of hubris among those executives. And also, I think just college admissions, the topic was every single reader has some sort of intersection with college admissions, whether it's their grandkid, their kid, that their self, they're on the alumni board. So that's like something that unites this country because college is the thing. Like we're all supposed to go to college and that's the big dream. So, Melissa, you you cover higher ed for The Wall Street Journal. I, I had heard on an, another show you called it the veneer of meritocracy. Can you talk about the way things were perceived prior to this breaking? Yeah. So I think the public mind, there's this assumption that if you work really hard and do your best and get good grades and have a lot of extracurriculars, you stand a chance of getting into the most selective schools. There's also underneath that this kind of resentment by certain people that you know, I'm being crowded out as these schools try to diversify their student population. So there's a couple of kind of conflicting elements there. But for people who are kind of in the industry or watch it very closely, we know that that's not entirely the case, that it's not just about if you work hard and do a good job, you'll get in. There are a lot of other competing elements and competing interests that admissions officers deal with. And I think this story, this whole scandal really ma made it very clear to many more people that it's not, it's nothing close to a meritocracy. Um, and I mean, yes, still, if you work hard and you get good grades and all of that, you have a better shot of getting into some of these schools, but it's still, you know, point kind of highlights some of these things that aren't really fair of if your parent went there. If your family gives a ton of money, if you're a celebrity or a kid of a celebrity, the school wants that name cachet. Um, if you play sports, you have an enormous leg up on other applicants. So this scandal was able to really reveal some of those kind of dirty little secrets that people in the industry already knew, but the public maybe didn't really want to believe yet. Right. Your book is fascinating. Uh, the way you guys really put the reader in the room. Which, by the way, is both of your first books, right? This is your first yes. foray into Jennifer. I'll go to you, you on this question. Um, you talk about in the book the side door that Rick Sanger was prying open, opening for people. Um, what is the side door? Okay, so Rick Singer, just a little context here, was a former basketball coach, and he figured out that a uh, couple things. Um, one that you know, a lot of people know athletes already have an advantage getting into college, but not just scholarship, like walk on athletes. So coaches have a certain number of spots and maybe you don't get a scholarship, but you get a nudge, you get the coaches uh, recommendation. And that gives you a great advantage in many schools to get in. And he also figured out that colleges increasingly rely on coaches to raise money. So along with coaching their team, they have to go out and 
you know, hit up parents and try to get money for everything from equipment to travel. And they don't like doing it. They hate it. A lot of them. And they get judged on it often. So, and another thing is that some of them don't get paid that much compared to the big name sports like football and basketball. So like water polo and those lower level sports. So you've got this combination of sort of some coaches re- like resentful. They want to make some more money. They're surrounded by lots of rich families and these sort of like quote, country club sports. Mm-hmm. And there's, they have these slots and the kids get advantage. So he puts this together and creates what he calls the side door. And he would tell parents, you can go the front door, which is just, you go in as yourself, you know, you submit your normal stuff. You can go the back door, which is the big donations. And everyone's heard of that, but that's not a guarantee. You And you have to give a lot of money for that. Or you can go on my side door, which is we get little Johnny in as a water polo player. He doesn't really have to play, but we'll give some money to this program, um, athletic program or, you know, coach. And now he gets in and he has this great advantage. So that was the side door. And he pitched it as um, as close to a guarantee as you can get in admissions for these types of schools that have, you know, 5, 10, 15 percent admit rates. So it's a close to advantage at a discount, right? So instead of having to give $10 million, uh, which would be the back door, you can give a few hundred thousand dollars to kind of a lower profile program and still get a ton of attention for it. Yeah. And you'd even give your money back. It was like such a guarantee that you even got your money back if you, if you didn't, if it didn't work out. So this is the part I think that a lot of parents struggle with. And I certainly have had these conversations with people, you know, how is this different from the person that just writes the big check, right? And little Johnny, you can't read, just going to Harvard. Like, how do you balance those two? Yeah. So one of the terms that we heard over and over in the courtroom uh, for many, many months was quid pro quo. Right. Um, so there were two elements. Was it it was it a direct kind of buying of an admission spot versus a donation out of the goodness of your heart? And maybe there could be, you know, a help, an advantage for your kid, but it's not guaranteed. And then there was also the fraud element. Right. These were, by and large, teenagers who did not play the sports that their application said they played and said that they excelled at. So there was just they were lying or the parents were lying. Rick Singer was lying about who these kids were. Uh, so that's a big part of how it, how it's different from kind of the more traditional, you know, send in a check and get put on some VIP admissions list. You know, I, when this broke, I, I did like I have done on, on my own personal cases and you representing clients and fraud cases, we try to diagram everything out. We flow chart who the players are and, you know, most conspiracies, it looks like a wheel. Somebody's in the middle of different hubs. This was a complex case. This wasn't just your uh, mom and pop fraud case. Can, can you guys explain you know, some of those spokes and the players involved here? Yeah, so there's the whole hub and spoke versus kind of rimless conspiracy. And I mean, that was one of the challenges in the case that a lot of the defendants put forward was, I didn't know this other parent. I wasn't conspiring with them on anything. I didn't know anybody in the testing scheme. You know, I knew Rick Singer and that was it. So how is this a conspiracy? And they really pushed back hard against that. But the the prosecutors, the ultimate charge was, you know, Singer was at the middle and then he had a couple of kind of fixers and helpers or the people he worked with on the, the testing scheme to help boost kids test scores, coaches that he worked with on the athletic side of things. And then there were the parents and some parents worked on just one. Some parents were involved in both sides of it. Some parents recommended other families to connect with Rick Singer. Um, and we had a whiteboard that it looked like I was, you know, kind of crazy conspiracy theorist lady with all of the lines. It was, a—I mean, there were more than 50 defendants. So it was just sprawling. So you guys uh, in the book and and, in the articles, by the way, if people really want to do a deep dive, pull some of the original reporting that came out of this story that Melissa and Jennifer did. Um, But you guys try to unravel how this investigation began. You talked to parents, you talked to a a student, you talked to all kinds of people here. Um, can you talk about how that investigation began? Who was this person that led to the unraveling of this complex fraud scheme? Well, first of all, some complaints came into Boston about a 
pump and dump scheme, which is a stock fraud scam. And some investors had been claimed they were ripped off. And so one thing led to another. Um, it The trail led to a man in L.A. And so investigators out there go and they do a, um, a, a raid at his house and they take away um, you know, laptops and, and so forth and documents. And his name is Maury Tobin. And he um, ends up coming, uh, going to Boston to meet with federal prosecutors that had been referred there at the U.S. Attorney's Office there. And like many white collar defendants, um, he agrees he wants to work with the government. Um, he has it's a much larger thing. It's a global um, operation. Apparently, he's going to give them information, um, maybe help out but before they're going to work with him. They really grill him. They have to talk to him for a long time and make sure that he doesn't have a lot of skeletons in his closet because they can't put him on the stand and have him attacked by the, the defense lawyer. So they're just looking at everything. They're asking him questions and they're looking at his bank accounts and they see that there's some money flowing from him to someone in Connecticut. And um, he offers that I've been bribing the, the so women's soccer coach at Yale. And so the prosecutor who was um, who was in that meeting was like ding 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 you know and he stays calm and it's just like oh that's interesting and tell me more and and i think he quickly realized he got out of that meeting he jogs down to his boss he's like i think we've got something better and so from there it one thing led to another they he um he led them to the coach at yale they did a sting they then flipped the coach at yale and they got him actually during the sting for the first time they're in a, a, a hotel in downtown Boston with Maury Tobin wearing a wire, people watching, listening. And the coach from Yale comes up and they're ironing out the last details of the of the bride payments. And at some point, the coach mentions um, Rick Singer. And that's the first time they heard of Rick Singer. So it just started with uh, a, a simple, fairly sim routine stock fraud. Right. And the coach essentially was like, wait, now remind me how we connected. Was this the bribe deal that we made directly? Or was it the one, one of the ones I did with Rick Singer? Like he had just so many going on and that they heard the singer name and, you know, and they were able to get um, the coach's permission and listen to his phone calls. They kind of helped him do some calls with Rick Singer. And then they got a wiretap on Rick Singer. Usually these sorts of things, um, you know, big conspiracies and you kind of work your way up to the big guy here, you had the ringleader ultimately flipped and agreed to cooperate with prosecutors and he hands it over his Rolodex. So it, you know, it was a little bit unique in that regard. I mean, once, once Singer got involved and he flipped, uh, you know, it kind of went the opposite way of what these sorts of cases usually do. So beyond the obvious that he was looking for some leniency or some, uh, uh, you know, reduce sentence on the back. And why do you think he was so willing to help? I mean, he was, he was had, right? <laughs> like, yeah. They had so much on it. They had hundreds of hours of phone calls and emails and text messages, and you couldn't get out of it. Yeah. I think he was an unwilling cooperator in the beginning. And he uh, initially, it was just sort of cornered, but he originally tipped off some of his clients and so then he got another charge of obstruction. And at that point, um, he started to cooperate. And then just the funny thing there is that, you know, he is the world's most competitive guy. It didn't matter if he was playing pickup basketball or what. So I, when he got on board, I think it also became about, if I'm going to be a cooperator, I'm going to be like the best cooperator. Ever. Yeah. The world's greatest witness. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I mean, part of it, you know, he did, had the obstruction charge added and then kind of, you know, had a, had a bit of a heart to heart with his lawyer of, you know, they've got you, like, you got to cooperate here. The best option for you right now is to cooperate. And, you know, he's still awaiting sentencing. Um, but the fact that so many parents and coaches pleaded guilty, two were found guilty in a jury trial, um, got a couple more kind of trials and sentencings coming up still, but, you know, he's, certainly hoping that the information he gave the prosecutors and the convictions they got for so many other people will help bring his sentence down. In uh, in researching my book, I learned a lot about private college admissions 
consultants, right? And they play they play a really important role, uh, the ethical ones, right? Especially when you think about the public schools that might be in rural areas or underserved, and they have school counselors advising 400, 500 students. Um, and I certainly have met so many of them that really go about it the right way. Um, I can't help but think that maybe Rick Singer started that way and then evolved over time into this mastermind corporate <laughs> uh, fraudster. Uh, do you have an idea of how he evolved over the years? Yeah, he did. He when he was a coach, um, he was at Sacramento State. And they um, they were trying to go to uh, Division One, and they had a, a terrible year. And so they all, you know, the coaches all got fired. And so here he was, you know, in his I think thirties, and he had always been he'd always had such a good relationship with kids. So he immediately didn't have a job. And so one of the other coaches um, was a guidance counselor at a school. So he just had Rick come in, sort of um, part time, and, and he said that you know Rick was just great with the kids. And these were disadvantaged kids. And he himself had not been privileged growing up. So I think he had a heart in some way for the hard scrabble path and here's what you can do and you got to buckle down and you could do this and that. Um, But he was just so, he was very good. Um, And again, the competitiveness of him, you know, he quickly becomes uh, a very sought after college counselor in Sacramento. And then word travels and his clients get wealthier and wealthier. And he he then is next thing you know, um, you know, he's being hired by uh, people down in Newport. I think it's just a combination of like his competitiveness and then what his clients expected. And he was going to meet that. And he looked at every case like a win and almost got some like a dopamine high, you know, from getting kids in. And there's evidence that, you know, as as you said, Jed, like he kind of started um, a little bit more on the straight and narrow and then began to test the line, figure out where the line was of how far he could go, you know, in terms of encouraging students to um, embellish their resumes or their essays about their extracurricular activities, um, you know, writing essays for the students. And that we really kind of started to see some evidence of that going back to the the late nineties. And then it kind of just built up and built up until, you know, fast forward a decade and you've got him or his team writing essays for people about how, how excited they are to go play tennis when they don't even own a tennis racket and um, checking off that they are a different race than they actually are because they think that'll give an advantage or debating whether to check off that they're a first generation college student versus a legacy um, their legacy, maybe being first gen will help them more is the argument. And so it was a progression farther and farther over the line until it was deep into illegal territory. I, as, as an attorney, I'm amazed at the number of people and the quality of people who spoke to you guys. How did you get people to talk? A lot of work, a lot of, you know, help working with attorneys, but also Honestly, like the attorneys at the beginning, particularly were, you know, no, absolutely not. You're not talking to my client, understandably. But we have to try to get the sides of people beyond just what's in the court files. So we did a lot of just reaching out to people directly, whether it was by text or sending letters to their home, driving all around um, L.A., which was challenging because they live in neighborhoods where you can't knock on the door because there's gates. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So Right. Yeah, they're, you know, taping a note to the gate or leaving a note in someone's mailbox and then getting a call back from a lawyer like you're really creeping out my client here. And our, you know, we kept to the same standard that we have at the journal of no surprises. So somebody's not going to all of a sudden read about themselves and be shocked that these allegations are, you know, in the paper have to give them a fair chance to respond, to correct us if there's a factual error, you know, before publication. And we really take that seriously. And we maintained that for the book. And, you know, we would tell lawyers like, listen, you know, we would love to speak to your client, but we don't know for sure that you're passing along the message. We hope you are, but we have to make sure that we're making a very good faith effort to connect with these people directly. 
Uh, so yeah, we're going to text them and we're also going to try to reach out to them directly. And it paid off in certain circumstances where a lawyer didn't want us to talk to somebody or the crisis communications team, because a lot of them hired PR consultants, they were locking things down and absolutely not, you know, not even entertaining the idea of us talking to the clients, but going directly to them sometimes led to some really fruitful conversations and, you know, there were people talking to us and their lawyers didn't even know they were talking to us. Uh, it, it makes me think of the story of Matteo Sloan. And as a father, it really pulls on my heart. Um, Jennifer, can you talk about Matteo and the interaction that he had with his father about around this? Yeah, sure. So Matteo Sloan was um, the son of Devin Sloan, who uh, ended up pleading guilty and, and going to prison for... Uh, paying Rick Singer to get Mateo into the University of Southern California as a water polo recruit. And Mateo, they lived in, in Bel Air and, um, you know, very wealthy family. And so um, I got a chance to speak with, with Mateo and he was very thoughtful. He, um, what he said is that, you know, so he'd gone to a, a very nice um, private school there and that he had been working very hard. He knew what was expected of him. And as he put it, he'd been on like a grind, you know, up till two in the morning doing his schoolwork, um, trying to do all the extracurriculars, the summer programs, everything to make his college resume look good. And he had a guidance counselor at school. They only had like a handful of kids each, you know, and and so he felt like he had a lot of attention. And then suddenly his dad brings in um, Rick Singer and Rick's coming over like Sunday nights and working with him. And Mateo had a list of schools that were really varied that he was wanted to go to, like UC Santa Cruz or you know Loyola, and it, they were probably on on par with what he could do. He was also a very good student. So Rick comes in and he said that they were really on him to go to USC, and and he th and that it would make his mom happy to have him down the road. And so he thought, OK, and he went there and he really liked it. And um, and then at some point along the way, his father, you know, asked him to pose in the pool with a, um, a ball and some, you know, a, a, like a little helmet. He didn't know exactly. He said that he had a relationship with his father where it was like his dad asked him to do something. He did it. He didn't know, like, was this part of some photo shoot or it's like, OK, whatever, you know, and it was kind of quick. and. So next thing you know, he gets into USC, he goes to USC and he's doing well. And um, he comes home on uh, on spring break in, in March and it's seven in the morning. His father uh, is taken away by a team of federal agents and he learns like the nation on the news and online what has happened, that he didn't get in the right way. Um, and it was pretty devastating. So his father's held all day and comes home late that night and he's in the kitchen and he just looks at his father and said, you know, why didn't you believe in me? Yeah, it's I mean, I think the the human element to a lot of this is something that it's easy to gloss over. But right. These are teenagers who their parents were telling them you're doing great. You're doing great. Um, and then kind of working the gears in the background to make sure that they got the, whatever their, their goal was um, in terms of college admissions. And it speaks a lot to the obsession a lot of these families had with reputation, the competitiveness, the, um, this idea that where your kid goes to school is a reflection of how you are as a parent. A lot of these families, like their definition of success was pretty skewed, this idea that there's really only like a dozen or so schools that were the the good schools, the acceptable outcomes when, you know, like Mateo is a great example. He would have done very well at a lot of different schools, but those weren't kind of good enough in, in parents' eyes or in Rick Singer's eyes or in community's eyes. This uh, anxiety hotbeds, you know, kind of Greenwich, around Bel Air, you know, these areas where it seems to be really, really um, I think you called it a blood sport when it comes to applying to the most selective colleges um, seems to have gotten worse over the years. Do you, do you have a sense of that, Melissa? Yeah. The frenzy around it all um, has continued to build. I've been covering higher ed from various angles for over a decade. 
Uh, it's certainly changed a lot since I was applying to schools in the early 2000s. There's this idea that the stakes have grown higher, right? Especially for people who are middle, upper middle class or in upper class um, backgrounds that you need to go to one of these schools in order to maintain this level of wealth and success. Uh, and there's, you know, anything else is sort of a failure. And, you know, I mean, Rick Singer certainly helped play that up. And there's something kind of sad about that because the sc- these schools, these highly selective colleges are a, such a tiny sliver of the college landscape, right? Most students go to schools that admit most applicants. These uh, very selective schools really, it's, they represent such a small share of the college population, yet they're the ones that get all the attention. They're the ones that you know, are written about in the paper. I spend plenty of ink writing about these schools and it it's becomes this really unhealthy echo chamber of this is a good school. This is not a good school. This is success. This is not. And, you know, where you go to college will shape your entire life. And it can, but it doesn't have to. And it's not like that acceptance letter is the end game right? Hopefully you get an acceptance letter and then you're off to start the next chapter of your life. That's such an important message uh, for the parents and who are watching the show or listening to the show to understand, you know, that there's, it's about finding the best fit for your student as opposed to chasing a ranking or uh, looking for a a sticker to put on the back of your car that's going to impress your friends. Thank you for that. My question, and I I asked this wearing uh, the hat of kind of the general public who doesn't see people devolve into fraud schemes on a regular (laughs) basis. But, you know, was there a sense from these parents that, hey, everybody's doing this or this is what you have to do uh, in order to get in nowadays? What level of justification was playing in the minds of these parents? I think that there there was. And and Rick Singer um, perpetuated that, you know, telling his clients, I'm doing this, all the all the families of your in your world are doing this. I think that fed into their their insecurity, um, definitely. And then uh, some of them, though, were there were quite a few people who knew this was off because you know they didn't tell anyone around them. Mm-hmm. And they, they were doing it, and they were you could see the hesitation. Um, but I just I owe this to my kid. There were different reasons. I mean, people thought you know, oh, we had a I had a divorce, and it wasn't fair to Jack. And his grades fell, so I'm going to make it up to him. There was there was some of that going on, and um, and then just sheer. Uh, it also got to be, I think, on a more crass level with some of the parents. They were just the type of people who made a call, you know, like, to make things happen in their life, and they've been doing that forever. And so college came along, and college was that. It was like I know a guy, you know, I'm going to call some get this taken care of. Right. Go to the Rolodex. Right. That's right. Yeah. But there was definitely a big element. I mean, one of the opening scenes of the book, right? We've got Jane Buckingham on the sidelines of a soccer game, freaking, you know, starting to get really concerned because she didn't have a college counselor for her son yet. And he was what, a sophomore at the time? Like, yeah. Every, you, oh, so many of them felt like they were already behind and that they couldn't afford to fall behind in this high stakes blood sport. And that's where it kind of all comes together. Of if these other people are trying to milk the system, we need to as well. Yeah. Did you get a sense of uh, whether the students knew what was playing out here? You know, from other people you saw and interacted with. It was, it was a mix. Yeah, yeah, it was a mix. There was there were definitely some cases where the kids knew and participated. They were on the calls. They were writing the phony essays. And in fact, the the in the beginning, we thought some of the students were going to be charged, the ones who were uh, 18 or over. And that never happened. And I think the prosecutors just came to realize that, you know, they said, look, they weren't the primary players. And but th- and there were other cases where the parents went to great lengths to keep it from the kids. And in just one um, example really vivid was, in fact, Jane Buckingham. She um, gave her son, told her him that she got permission to give him the the ACT at home, which sounds incredible. But if you know her and how she just got everything done, and your mother was her, you might think, oh, of course my mom did. So, but she timed him, you know, took breaks, 
time, put them in a certain place and then actually like put it in the mail and mailed it somewhere. Like it's just all a big. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, they, some of them went to really extreme lengths, but as, as Jennifer said, in some cases they posed for pictures knowing what they were posing for, or they sat to take a, the SAT or ACT and had, you know, a discussion with the proctor um, as they fed the student the right answers. And the judge uh, who sentenced most of the parents, she reacted quite strongly to that. And she said, you know, if you brought your kid into this and you made them a co-conspirator, you know, that's even worse. So you saw that in, in the sentencings. Uh, she would often really rip into the parents for whom the when the kids were involved and they would be getting harsher sentences. Just to add one of the um, kind of sad part cases I remember was um, this daughter who her, her dad was trying to get her into USC and she, he was trying to keep it secret from her. But she knew darn well that she shouldn't be going to USC. She saw students, her classmates getting rejected. And, and so she, it didn't feel good to her. And she's like, Dad, what is going on? Like, why am I getting into USC? And he's talking to Rick Singer saying, my daughter knows something's up and she doesn't want, you know, she's worried. I mean, it kind of goes back to like, I don't think they, they didn't do the kids a favor because, you know, down deep, like when you, when you it doesn't feel good when you get something or, or maybe they deserved it, but once they found out they got it the wrong way, it just completely they had the opposite effect of whatever the parents were trying to do. 100%. You know, I, I think of Felicity Huffman. I think you guys talked about how she helped one daughter through the league and then had second thoughts. And the second daughter, she ended up not going through this uh, back channel. Um, did you come across other parents like that who were conflicted and helped one student and not the other? Um, not to that extent. There were a lot of parents who used Rick Singer for multiple kids. Um, and sometimes it was going over many, many, many years, right? The kids were spread out in age. I'm thinking of Doug Hodge, the former head of PIMCO. Um, you know, he worked with Singer for over a decade or about, um, about a decade. Uh, so, you know, some had a little, some more, discomfort than others, uh, kind of being repeat customers. But with Huffman, and that was one of the reasons the judge said that she ultimately got such a light sentence was because she was given the choice and she chose not to do it a second time. Like she recognized that it was wrong. As a parent, uh, you know, as I read your book, I actually read it twice. The first time I read it for preparing for this interview. And the second time I read as a trying to understand more about the parents, like what led them to do this. And you guys made this book so relatable. I couldn't help but feel myself saying, you know what? I could see myself doing this. Maybe not to the extent of honest services fraud and, and committing uh, all these criminal acts, but you you want the best for your child. You can see how this could happen. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I think even people who aren't parents can relate to this, right? You want yeah. the best for the people you love, but I was in the process of my daughter starting pre-K while we were writing this book. And, um, you know, there were jokes going around of like, okay, if you slip a little money to the parent coordinator, do you then get into the school? And this is for public school. Um, and it's just, you can see how easily people might go over that line because, you know, you want it, you'll do anything for them. And you really want to believe, well, you wouldn't do anything. There, there, there is a line that you would draw. And, um, you know, late in the book, I, I went back to my old high school and gave a presentation to the parents of seniors there. And, you know, we have the, the scene in the book of all these parents essentially saying like, oh, that was crazy. That scandal. They, you know, I would never do that. I think mm. maybe <laughs> I, I hope I, think, I would never right? do that yeah. sort of attitude. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a lot of the, high schools, private high schools across the country, right? Tout where did their uh, students have ended up matriculating, right? So it, it does seem to be one of these things that just constantly feeds upon itself. Yeah, there's a lot of blame to go around in, in this, really, when you look at, yeah, the, the, the school, but yeah, like you said, the school websites, and um, so they, they fed into it. So how do we reform this? You know, is the public or, you know, people that are involved in different industries, um, how do we possibly reform what happened? Or have you guys seen any reform since this broke? So some schools, um, some colleges and universities added an extra layer of 
authorization or you needed another level of review when you were flagging somebody as a recruited athlete or even a walk-on, um, you know, actually look at the game tape. Another athletics administrator needs to sign off on it. Uh, so it wasn't just the coach's word. Some schools started to actually check that people who were admitted as recruits were on the rosters once they got to school. Uh, they apparently weren't doing that before, uh, which just shows kind of how wide open this door was for on the athletic side of things. The A lot of schools have stopped requiring SAT and ACT scores for admissions. And it was not because of the scandal that exposed some major security flaws in the tests, but it was because of the pandemic and just kids couldn't get to take the tests. So the school really couldn't require a test score. And we've now got thousands of colleges and universities that don't require scores. Uh, and some of them say it's just for a few years, but really hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube there. Um, it's, you know, the, Tests matter a lot less now than they did three years ago. So what happened to the students here? The, all these families, dozens of families, students getting out of colleges uh, that they shouldn't have been in. What happened to them? It, it seemed like, um, you know, it was a real mix. Um, they, the schools took a variety of approaches. A lot of these kids were already in, in college. And so yeah. some of the colleges, what they did is they, they said, well, if the kid knew about it uh, and played a role, you're out of there. Um, if you didn't know and you're there and you're doing okay, they, some were allowed to stay. And then others have struggled, you know, because with some of the parents who for a long time did not plead that the kids were kind of casting about, they couldn't tell the school, like, you know, they couldn't say anything they, to the school. They couldn't write letters. And but there were some that made it their essays. Uh, they were still in high school and took the experience and like made it something. And, so they seem to be trying to move on. Right. Yeah. A lot of them have landed on their feet. The ones who were kind of in the process of applying or, you know, had already put in their applications, but were still in high school when everything broke. Most of them have ended up at schools now that seem to be good fits for them. They're figuring things out. A lot of them are also still figuring out how to repair the relationships with their parents. Talking with one um, lawyer and his client was going to to talk with us. And then, but then he said no, because um, his daughter goes from completely not speaking to him to speaking to him. He could tell that it had really, you know, maybe irreparably damaged some relationships. You know, how do you move on from that knowing that your parent thought that they needed to lie, cheat, and steal to get you into school? <laughs> A lot of counseling. Jennifer and uh, Melissa, I really appreciate you taking time today. Um, spotlighting really the full story. So when you start to understand how this could all play out in so many different levels, I think there's blame to go around, uh, as you said, Jennifer, and maybe, maybe this uh, will lead to some reforms down the, down the road. And uh, if you have not bought the book, I highly recommend it. I don't usually do this on this show, but this is a book that I read, as I said, twice. I'm sure I'll read it a third time. Unacceptable Privilege Deceit in the Making of a College Mission Scandal by Melissa Korn and Jennifer Love it. Jennifer, Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Fraud in America. Today's episode was made possible because of the generous donation of longtime Taft supporter and whistleblower attorney David L. Heron. If you believe you have witnessed fraud against the government or fraud on the financial markets, we encourage you to visit our website at taf.org, where you will find a directory of member attorneys who represent whistleblowers across the country. On our website, you will also find additional information about our nation's various whistleblower laws and programs and a way to donate to our organization as we step forward in spreading information about whistleblower programs. This episode was edited and produced by Rachel Brooks, and our theme song is by Connor Chaos. A big thank you to our Taft staff and researchers of James King, Emma Bass, Jackie DeMar, Kate Scanlon, Max Boldman. Fraud in America is a project of Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund. The opinions expressed on today's show belong solely to the guest and are not necessarily endorsed by the organization. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Fraud in America.